about some of my ongoing PhD work, which is mostly looking at funerary diversity in the British Reading period. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of an overview about what I'm looking at and why, and hopefully indicate why I want to come off the beaker focus, not because I'm doing the writing at the moment. So the beaker phenomenon was a widespread cultural phenomenon found across Europe in the 3rd to 2nd millennia BC. And in Britain, the Beaker period covers the transition between the Neolithic and the Chalcolithic, but also the transition between the Chalcolithic and the Early Bronze Age. So it's a fairly crucial stage of British Greek history. Um, you see the uh, Beaker phenomenon primarily in archaeological contexts, and that's particularly the case in Britain. Um, so when we think of the uh, Beaker burials, um, what comes to mind is a highly um, standardised, almost stereotyped idea in the popular imagination. That's among archaeologists as well as among the general public. So this is a schematic illustration of your, your typical beaker burial, as I refer to them. And it's a crouched or flex, articulated inhumation burial, particularly of a single individual who is often an adult male. Um, they're found usually with a beaker, um, giving the name to the, the cultural group, and they may or may not be associated with a range of objects which are collectively referred to as the beaker material cultural package. So under the cultural historical paradigm, the, per the presence of these particular sets of burials and less spread across Europe was seen as indicative of the presence of the beaker folk and their movement of migration. And that idea, of course, was problematised in the latter half of the 20th century where people suggested um, interpretations that move away from the, the need for migrations and the whole pots equals people thing. So we have a whole load of alternative interpretations that have flourished over the last 50 odd years of research, um, and there's just loads of different interpretations. So people have suggested that these um, burials are indicative um, instead of a diffusion of different types of ideas. Um, it could be a cult related to alcohol consumption, it could be um, the expression of high status, it could be indicative of shifts in social structuring or understanding of personhood and identity. Um, the burials could be indicating something of cosmological significance, um, perhaps they're expressing some kind of idealised warriorhood status or idealised masculinity. There's this whole load of stuff which um, each idea has had uh, varying levels of success in various periods of peak currency in the literature, but collectively they've all served to enrich the discussions that we're having about these burials in this period. However, a rather large spanner was thrown into the theoretical works early in this year, of the geneticists. Um, and what this paper shows, the big genetic study, is that the beaker phenomenon and its spread around Europe is associated, at least in part, with genetic change. So we do have to bring back the idea of migration again. However, what this paper is not showing is a one-to-one -one relationship between a particular genotype and the beaker phenomenon itself. So this is not a return to pots equals people, even though I have heard some people try and interpret it as such. The more unexpected finding, for me at least, was the scale of the genetic transition in Britain, um, where there's an almost complete genetic um, replacement is indicated by this paper. So the suggestion is there's a 90% or more population change between the Neolithic and the roundabout Middle Bronze Age. So what we're left with now is this um, period of major transition archaeologically. So we see that in terms of the material culture, in terms of burial practices. So the late Neolithic, the most common rite is cremation, unaccompanied cremation burial. So we see the appearance of an entirely new rite and all of the things that burial practices could signify. And then we have all of the technological changes across this period. And in addition to that, we have a genetic transition. So what my work is trying to do is incorporate all of these different forms of evidence to actually bring together all of the knowledge that we currently have to create a more nuanced understanding of what was going on. I think as archaeologists, we need to go back to the archaeological evidence and see how it can be reinterpreted in this new light. And what I've realised is by going back to the burial evidence, I think our data set is completely wrong. I think that our focus on this stereotyped idea of what beaker burials look like is a self-reinforcing concept. The type of chronology is actually hugely unhelpful across this period because we have such a strong idea of what a beaker burial should look like that we're actually ignoring all of the evidence for everything that looks, that looks different to it. And if we're ignoring all of the evidence for variation and diversity, how can we possibly look at a period of transition? So what I'm doing is looking again at burials, including the weird ones, which I'm calling atypical beaker burials, such as this, the Boston and Bowman, a multiple mixed right burial in the same grave, and actually trying to move past the idea of the stereotypes that we have around the archaeology to bring it into a more nuanced understanding.
So my key questions are, firstly, what funerary practices are there if we set aside the stereotypes? So I'm looking for cremation, disarticulation, excarnation, mummification, whatever. And I'm interested in any meaningful variation that might help us actually look at the processes of the transition period. I want to know what was actually going on on the ground during this major phase of transition. And obviously, even though I'm broadening it out, I'm still only looking at the burial evidence. So this is still one particular view that I'm giving. But I'm hoping that just by expanding the data set, I'll be able to get a little bit closer to understanding what's going on. So as an overview of what I've um, found so far, I'll very briefly give you a, a couple of things. Um, so this is the distribution of Clark's 1970 Beaker corpus. Um, so while obviously this is a bit old, it gives a fairly good indication of the presence of Beaker material culture across Britain. This is the Beaker People Project data set, 333 burials from the right time period. Um, it's very um, biased in terms of its distribution for various regions. Um, for various reasons, but it does show areas of concentration which should then be reinforced by the sampling method. My data set is um, 273 burials so far across the period, which I deem atypical, so they don't match our expectations of what a beaker burial should look like. And they are more broadly distribu distributed than the Beaker People Project data set, but more closely aligned to Clark's. So most of the burials in my atypical data set are aligned with the places where we expect to find a typical beaker burial. There are areas of density that correspond across all of the different data sets. However, there are also tantalising suggestions that some of the atypical burials, particularly the ones that are not associated with beaker period material culture, are actually occurring in regions outside the key areas of beaker material culture presence. So while I'm not suggesting that there are areas that were rejecting the beaker phenomenon or even were outside its sphere of influence, there is a strong possibility that there are regional variations in what was deemed appropriate in terms of burial practices. And that's something that is played out among all the other forms of evidence. We see regional variations in pretty much all the different burial practices, which kind of gets blurred out when you're just looking at this one typological norm. Um, moving on to the osteological analysis. I found, and this is just showing the atypical burials, I found that a large group of the atypical burials are single individuals buried on their own, and that's what we'd expect from a typical beaker burial. However, there are also rather a lot of individuals here in multiple burials, so we can't talk about this period as showing a simple shift from Neolithic multiple burial to Calcolithic or Bronze Age individual inhumation. And we've, we've read a lot into what that shift means on a, on a social level and in terms of interpretation of what, how people were viewing themselves and each other. So some of those interpretations really need to be reworked. Um, interestingly, these multiple burials are where you find most of the infants and children. So the atypical remains are not just their exclusion is not just biasing the data set in that we're missing some information, it's actually systematically biasing the data set against the inclusion of certain groups of society. And if you are missing out all of the children, for example, of course you're going to start to get changes in the interpretations of the burials. The breakdown of the adult individuals into male and females is slightly less clear as a pattern, but it does appear that women are more likely to be found in multiple burials than in individual animations. So if we're systematically excluding women and children, it's no wonder that our interpretations of these burials have been things like performative masculinity and warrior status. I think we need to try and move past that because we've been looking at a cherry-picked data set. <coughs> Moving on to chronology, I have done Bayesian phase modelling. I've done a whole load of other things, and I'm happy to talk about the methodology later, ideally, in the pub. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you find me a dream. Um, what I'm going to show you very briefly is a, a different approach, some probability distribution. So what this is doing is, again, stripping out the typological assessments that we make and actually just looking at the dates as a whole. So this is a summed probability plot of all of the radiocarbon uh, dates for burials across the late Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, all of the ones that I can get hold of this is, so about 2,500 of them. The height of the plot relates to the relative intensity or the, the relative height of the summed probability. So it's indicating relative shifts in prevalence. We can break this down using whatever characteristics you want to tag it with. Um, and so I've broken it down here into articulated burials, the black line, cremations, the red line, and disarticulated burials, the blue line. So if we 
look at this this period here, the Calcolithic, as we like to call it sometimes. Um, if you look at the red and the blue lines, cremation and disarticulation, respectively, what you can see is that actually the level of cremation and disarticulation is remaining at a relatively constant level from that seen in the late Neolithic. What we're not seeing is a complete disappearance or a hiatus in these practices, as being suggested in previous studies and previous understandings period. We have this narrative that the leak phenomenon appears and then suddenly everything else stops. But that's not what the radiocarbon data are showing when we're looking at the burial practices. The question that's raised here for me is when we see this large increase in articulated burials just after 2500, this is of course indicating the arrival of the leak phenomenon and its associated rites. But does this large increase indicate a large change in population? Because as a, an osteologist, an increase in population is just more potential corpses. So if we are talking about major shifts in demography, prehistoric demography, I think we need to be really careful about the kind of language that we're using and the ways we're describing it. We don't want to end up with Dutch hordes or waves of invasion if we're actually not certain that that's how we should be interpreting it. Tom has written about these things in the past. Sorry to point, <laughs> point you out there. Um, but a paper was published just a couple of days ago um, in antiquity, which I'll encourage anyone reading if they're interested in the potential use and misuse of, of this kind of information. So the reason why I asked the question about changes to demography is that previous studies have indicated a statistically significant increase in population over the week period. I have replicated these findings and realised that yes, no matter how you look at it, there is a statistically significant increase in population. However, this is using the particular methods, the particular population proxy in some probability distribution. If I break that down by dates for burials versus radiocarbon dates for everything else, all other anthropogenic dates, the entirety of this lump, which is the postulated population increase, is actually comprised of an increase in burials. Everything else flatlines across the period. So the evidence at the current stage cannot say that there is an increase in population in terms of numbers across this period. People have presented it as far clearer than it actually is. And I think the evidence is actually quite equivocal about whether we're looking at an increase in numbers or if we're just looking at an increase in burial practices, or perhaps we may just be looking at an increase in burials that are nice for dating. These ones are associated with artifacts and they're good for forming type of chronologies. Moving on to the um, final aspect I've looked at, going to the um, actual genetics themselves. This is the modelled admixture plots for all of the burials in my data set, um, or ones that are closely associated with ones in my data set that I found in the Beaker Genetics paper. And the pattern of these is that all of them show admixture between the Europe, well, almost all of them show admixture between the European Beaker and the British Neolithic DNA. This set of data, the atypical burials, don't look any different from the rest of the material, the typical burials. And what the pattern shows overall is that right from the very beginning of the Calcolithic, we see a pattern of admixture. That's regardless of the type of burial, the location of the burial, or the artefacts that it's associated with. So my overall finding is that while there are variations across Britain in terms of which burial practices were, were being carried out. There are regional differences and there are certainly differences among people based on their, their role in society and their stage of life. Actually the overall pattern is one of interaction. Even in the places where it appears that there's continuity from the Neolithic, the findings suggest that the beaker phenomenon as a whole is actually inherently mixed, it's inherently variable. And that's one of the findings that actually matches up with people on the continent who've been doing similar work to me. Everywhere you look at the beaker phenomenon, the more variable it seems when we move past our stereotyped ideas about what it should like, look like. And I think actually it's possible that one of the strengths of the beaker phenomenon, and possibly even one of the reasons why it was so successful in its spread, is the fact that it does incorporate pre-existing um, ways of life. And that's particularly the case for other areas of information outside the burial practices as well. There's evidence for continuity of um, settlement types and things like that, for example. So I think the strength of the beaker phenomenon is it's in its diversity. And by focusing on a cherry-picked set of data which conforms to stereotypes, we're actually overlooking the thing that makes it most interesting. Um, I need to do more work on incorporating this new diversity and actually rethinking how we can theorise these burials, given that most of the pre-existing interpretations, I think, actually are probably just wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>